The villains are easily Disney's most popular characters, and when people like characters, they want to know more about them. Sometimes we get spin-offs, but other times, fans have to take matters into their own hands, and that's exactly what we'll be looking at today. Over the years, we've seen countless theories focus on the various Disney villains. For example, expanding on their backstories or tying those characters into other Disney properties. But out of them all, which are plausible and which ones are too out there? Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Bench, and this is Disney Villain Theory. BS to Truth Bombs. First, let's examine the theories that are too out there to be true, not enough evidence in the source material, or have been debunked by the creators themselves. To put it simply, these theories are bullshit. Vanessa was Ursula's original form. In The Little Mermaid, Ursula transforms into the beautiful Vanessa as part of her plan to marry Prince Eric. However, this popular theory suggests that there was more to this form than meets the eye. Vanessa was actually what Ursula once was. Long before the events of the film, Ursula was a mermaid, not entirely unlike Ariel, but her use of sorcery slowly transformed her body into a sea witch. While this is a relatively sensible theory, it falls apart because there isn't enough evidence to support it. Vanessa in the original fairy tale is completely different from the Disney version. There doesn't exist anything in that story to hint that she's a younger form of Ursula. Earlier versions of the film script, which do have variations on the scenes with Vanessa, do not suggest this either. Spin-off materials such as books and animated series also offers little to suggest any truth to this theory. As we said prior, this isn't too outlandish of a theory to buy into. It's the evidence that ultimately fails this idea, as there exists too little to really connect the characters beyond what is already shown. Maybe future spin-off stories will add weight to this theory, but for the time being, consider this one debunked. Next are theories that have decent evidence, but are also hampered by a lot of flaws and holes. These theories are full of holes. Facilier's friends are other Disney villains. In The Princess and the Frog, the evil shadow man, Dr. Facilier, is accompanied in his mission by his so-called friends on the other side. They are a frightful crew, but there's a fan theory that makes them even more terrifying. This theory posits the idea that all these friends are actually the other villains of the Disney animated canon. The theory argues that certain silhouettes bear an uncanny resemblance to these classic villains. One looks to be Scar, another Radigan, and another is Judge Claude Frollo. This doesn't sound too out of the realm of possibility, but there are a few things about this theory that don't totally make sense in our eyes. First, to truly believe this theory, you have to buy into the notion that all the Disney films are on the same timeline. After this, you run into a brick wall almost immediately. These characters can't all be Disney villains because we've seen numerous Disney films that take place long after the 1920s, which is when Princess and the Frog takes place. Look at The Lion King, for example, as it's one of the films brought up. While there's nothing that indicates this film didn't take place before that period, it could have been after this film as well. Because there's a variety of Disney villains who take Take place in more modern times and even in the far off future, we unfortunately can't fully get behind the idea that all these characters accompanying him are other Disney villains. Is this theory creative? Most definitely. Does it hold genuine weight? The answer is a resounding no. Jafar was the hero. In Aladdin, Jafar's goal is to become the Sultan of Agrabah and become Sorcerer Supreme. Or is it? In a theory from the YouTube channel, Cracked, it's argued that Jafar was actually the hero of the story. Since the film is told to us from the lens of a peddler, the story we see unfold could have easily been altered or changed. There's nothing to indicate that the peddler couldn't have been an unreliable narrator. As such, it's possible that Jafar was actually a hero, attempting to save Agrabah from its incompetent leader. But the thief, Aladdin, ruined his plans. The peddler just rewrote the story by reversing the roles of both Jafar and Aladdin. While we have to say that this theory is one of the more creative ones in this video, we don't think it's entirely accurate. If you buy into the idea that Jafar was a hero trying to keep Agrabah safe, then couldn't he have used his powers to make the Sultan into a better leader? At no point in the story could it be argued that Jafar was interested in bettering the community or anyone other than himself. He has no problem using pawns and achieving his goals, and when he acquires Genie's powers, he only uses them to his advantage and not for Agrabah. While you could say that the peddler was just really stretching the lie, we feel that if Jafar was a hero, we would have seen more shades of gray in his character, rather than being purely a villain. Although Jafar is definitely a hero in his mind, the idea that this was true in the film's universe has too many holes. The next theories are not completely perfect, but they have a lot more
lot more evidence going for them. These theories are possible. Captain Hook killed Ariel's mother. And the Little Mermaid, Ariel is a daughter of King Triton. But who was her mother? We don't properly get an explanation about her in the film, but everything suggests she died before the events of the film. But how? Well, what if it was Captain Hook who murdered her? This theory sounds a little far-fetched, but once you begin to delve deeper into the lore, there might be some truth to it. In the direct-to-video prequel, Ariel's Beginning, we finally learn what happened to Ariel's mother. As it turns out, she was killed by a pirate. And you know who else is a pirate? Well, there's not a lot of pirates in the Disney canon, so you guessed it, Captain Hook. Some may say the theory doesn't work, because Peter Pan takes place in the 1900s, long after the events of The Little Mermaid. But those voices seem to forget that Hook is a denizen of Neverland. In that realm, nobody ages. And it could exist outside of our ideas of space and time. So it's possible that Hook, while out on a voyage, murdered Ariel's mother. Of course, was this theory at all the intention of the creators? No, probably not, which is why it's lower on the list. But it's still one of the more exciting crossover theories we've looked at. King Candy was an unfinished character. The main villain of Wreck-It Ralph is King Candy, better known by his previous form, Turbo. Turbo was obsessed with sneaking his way into other arcade games until becoming the king of the game Sugar Rush. Oh, my loyal subject! However, a theory from Reddit user, Olympus Man, indicates that there might be a bit more to King Candy's character. This theory says that King Candy was actually supposed to be a playable character in the Sugar Rush game, but the developers cut him before it was released, leaving his programming unfinished. This theory has a lot going for it, so let us explain why it's possible. First, the idea that King Candy was unfinished explains why the inhabitants of the game were so quick to buy into the idea that he was always the ruler of the game. If he was a planned character, his code would have been somewhat built into the game, so it's possible that the other characters would have always recognized him on some level. It could also give depth to the conflict between King Candy and Penelope. Perhaps King Candy was cut in favor of Penelope's character, but he swapped their codes around? Overall, it sounds entirely possible that King Candy was an unfinished character, and Turbo exploited this fact to his benefit. Whether or not it was the creator's intent is another story, but this theory is pretty solid. Megara is Yzma. Okay, before you write this section off, hear us out for a moment. In a Reddit thread posted by user Amrace, it's hinted that Yzma is in fact an older version of Megara from Hercules. After the film, Meg and Hercules had children, but just like in actual Greek mythology, Hercules kills their family. Megara goes mad because of this, and later resurfaces during the era of the Inca Empire, which leads to the events of the Emperor's New Groove. Although this theory sounds crazy when you first hear it, the more you think about it, the more it grows on you. Megara and Yzma have similar body types, and they both have a pretty sharp sense of humor. Kronk is also somewhat similar to Hercules, in that both are buff but not completely bright characters, further deepening their similarities. It's also hinted by Cusco that Yzma has been around for a long, long time. Everybody hits their stride. You just hit yours 50 years ago. While this could simply be Cusco displaying his rude attitude, it could also again signal Yzma's ties to Megara. The worlds of Hercules and the Emperor's New Groove are already among some of the more cartoony and wacky worlds seen in the Disney canon, so it isn't totally crazy to say that Megara and Yzma are the same. It might be a stretch as far as fan theories go, but it's a fun stretch. The next series might have a flaw or two in their logic, but the evidence presented is overwhelmingly in their favor. These theories are probable. Gaston is who the Beast could have become. In Beauty and the Beast, we're told that the Beast, previously Prince Adam, was a deeply selfish and vain man. You want to know who else fits that description? Who else but Gaston? This theory, originally posted by Reddit user Canadian Shadow, implies that Gaston isn't just the main villain. He's also an echo of what the Prince could have become if he was never cursed and continued down his egotistical path. Beyond just their similar personalities, there are a few other elements that connect both of these characters. They feature strong physiques, and they even have blue eyes. It's also interesting to note that Gaston is killed around the same moment in the film that the Beast turns back into Prince Adam. While true love was what made him human again, perhaps facing an even more extreme version of his past persona also helped break the curse. The prequel novel, The Beast Within, further connects these two characters, showcasing that Adam and Gaston had actually been best friends before his transformation into the Beast. Although its canonicity to the animated film is a little unclear, it's yet another piece of material that ties the characters together. While 
it's never stated in the film or other material, it seems more than likely that Gaston and the Beast have more in common than either would like to admit. Hades' hair color represents his emotions and powers. One of the more unique elements of Hades' character design has got to be his hair. Rather than a head of luscious locks, his cranium is adorned by an always present flame. While most would write it off as a cool visual detail and nothing more, Reddit user Superblue argues that it has more relevance to his character than you may have thought. He claims that his emotions and power level are represented by his hair color and the intensity of its flame. When it comes to Hades' emotions, the hair color is most certainly representative of them. When he's in a pleasant mood, the hair is usually its typical blue. However, when he's angry or upset, it becomes a more traditional red and orange color. Is waltzing around in the world! In terms of representing his power, that's a little less clear, which is why the theory is in this section. Hades possesses the ability to influence and use fire, but it's never made explicitly clear in the film that this is derived from his hair. We also never see the color of his hair change because of his powers. It's only in relation to whatever emotional state he's in. Perhaps his hair color does change due to the intensity of his powers, but it's never featured in any official media. While Hades' emotions are foreshadowed by the color of his hair, whether or not his powers are influenced by that element is a completely different question. Hans is a magic mirror. This next theory comes from the Super Carlin Brothers here on YouTube. It states that Hans, the main villain of Frozen, isn't a villain in the traditional sense. Really, he's just a magic mirror, feeding the worst aspects of the characters. In the fairy tale that inspired Frozen, the Snow Queen, there's a magic mirror that shows off the characters at their absolute lowest. This aspect of the story isn't in the film, but the channel argues that Hans fills the void left in its absence. And they make a convincing case. Hans is never seen in the film by himself. He's always accompanied by others, and just like the mirror, he feeds the negative aspects of characters like Anna and Elsa. In one of the more intriguing pieces of evidence mentioned in the theory, Hans looks at himself in a mirror after revealing his villainy to Anna, which makes the theory more plausible. As 13th in line in my own kingdom, I One of the many complaints about the Frozen film is that Hans is a weak antagonist, with not much of an elaboration on his backstory and motive. But if he was intended to be this film's equivalent to the mirror from the original story, it would certainly explain why his character is somewhat lacking. He may not be a mirror in the literal sense, but this Disney villain definitely reflects the flaws and weaknesses of his comrades, making this theory more likely to be true. At long last, we've reached the theories that have evidence too strong to not be true, or have been confirmed by the creators involved. These theories are truth bombs. Tremaine killed Cinderella's father. In Cinderella, we don't get much of an explanation about what happened to Cinderella's dad. All we know is that he married Tremaine, and then sometime after that, he died. Redditor Iska Hylock suggests that he didn't succumb to illness or anything like that, but was murdered by Tremaine. To start off, it would certainly fit her character. She always finds new ways to make Cinderella's life miserable in both the original movie and its sequels. So why would murder be out of the question? She's stolen from the fairy godmother in the third film, so her killing somebody isn't entirely far-fetched. Power, riches, revenge. However, what makes this theory a certified truth bomb is that it wasn't explicitly made canon in an official Disney source. In the book, Cold Hearted, it's explicitly stated that she did kill Cinderella's father and used dark magic to do so. While it's debatable whether or not this is how she would have killed him, it would at the very least explain why nobody ever connected her to it or why it wasn't deemed a murder. Because it fits well with what we know of the character and official Disney material has made it canon, this is no theory. This is our very first truth bomb. But not our last. Scar's rule over the Pride Lands was unnatural. At the midpoint of The Lion King, Scar kills Mufasa and quickly assumes control of the Pride Lands in the aftermath of his death. To greet the dawning of a new era. While the land was beautiful and thrived under Mufasa's reign, under Scar, it's relegated to a desolated and barren-looking wasteland. Why is this? While many will chalk it up to Scar being an unfit and poor leader, one popular theory implies that there's a more cosmic reasoning behind this. Because Scar was such a horrible and cruel being, his reign effectively disrupted the circle of life. He allowed the hyenas to run amok and kill off most of the animals present in the Pride Lands. With no prey for the predators to eat, they and the lions are left to starve, breaking how the circle of life is supposed to work, as told to us by Mufasa. Then, at the end, Simba returns and restores the Pride Lands to its former glory, as he was Mufasa's natural heir and a far better king. It's not displayed prominently, but it's a strong and interesting bit of sub 
subtext to the film and its themes. In conclusion, this is a theory most strongly supported by the film itself, and as such, it has to be the most likely theory in this video. Scar might not be the king of the Pride Lands anymore, but he can at least be happy his theory reigns supreme. Alright guys, that's it. Let us know in the comments section if you agree with our ranking, and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos, but most importantly, stay wicked.